welcome back to the uh, second second hour of our wonderful program at CATS. And we're very delighted to have Boris Springborn who will tell us about discrete uniformization and ideal hyperbolic polyhedra. Yes, thanks for the opportunity to give this talk. Um, I'll try to explain in some detail, maybe not sufficient detail, but at least some detail, Two, the, how two different subjects are connected, namely uh, discrete uniformization and the geometry of ideal hyperbolic polyhedra. And ideal doesn't mean that they're very good, but that they have their vertices uh, at the boundary of hyperbolic space. Now, uh, let's start with part one about discrete conformal maps and discrete uniformization. Um, now I'd like to show you some pictures of what we're talking about first. Here you see an example of a, a discrete conformal map. You have a, a oddly shaped polygonal region on the left, and this is mapped to a rectangle on the right. And uh, you will notice that the geometry of the, the, the combinatorics of the triangulations is the same actually. For example, this point gets mapped to this corner, this point, get mapped to this corner and these two points get mapped to the top corner and you can find your way through the triangulation and check that they're actually combinatorially equivalent. Oops, I made a mistake. It's not this one, it's this one. And, uh, and uh, what you see, so, so the triangulation is these thin lines and the thick square pattern shows you visually how conformal this map is or not meaning um, this regular pattern on the rectangle has moved back to the original domain. Um, and and uh, if it was really conformal, you should have uh, almost uh, perfect squares of different sizes on the left. And how does this work? Well, it's this uh, concept of Feng Luo, where you're uh, allowed to change the edge lengths only via scale factors attached to the vertices. So you have e to the ui, positive scale factors at every vertex. And, uh, and each edge length on the left, so here okay, you have i, j, you have the edge length l, i, j. And on the corresponding edge on the right image, you have the edge length l tilde, i, j. And you're supposed to, uh, to change it by uh, a factor that's the geometric mean of the scale factors at the vertices i and j. That's the only way you can change length. And the idea is that you should expect, and so there's empirical evidence that as you choose finer and finer triangulations, uh, the thing becomes more and more conformal. And uh, you see the pattern on the left here of the squares looks almost smooth and the squares look like they should under a conformal map. Um, we have before turned this into something applied in computer graphics where they are interested in conformal maps for texture mapping that is putting pictures onto triangle meshes, usually their hair and eyes and makeup and whatever. Uh, but here we uh, just to demonstrate the conformality, we put some uh, regular patterns uh, on the on the surfaces. Then this is to show that this can actually be computed also for re really large meshes. There are thousands or tens of thousands of vertices in each of these meshes. Um, and here's a fun example. It's a labyrinth. You go in at the top, you want to come out at the bottom. And here's a path through the labyrinth. But in fact, this is just a conformal map where the interior of this labyrinth is just a topological disk with, uh, uh, you know, all these dead ends being arms that stick out on the side. And uh, this, what you see here really is a conformal map of this disk to a rectangle with the entrance AB mapped to the top side of the rectangle and the exit CD mapped 
to the bottom side of the rectangle. And what you see here, this coloring, is just this square pattern of the uh, image rectangle pulled back to the, to the labyrinth. And the fact that the dead ends appear blue is just because in the conformal map to the rectangle, all these uh, sticking out dead ends get squished, uh, uh, all the lengths get scaled down so much that they are mapped to the outer blue uh, stripes of this target rectangle. So that's really, that's how this conformal maps finds a path through the labyrinth. You see here, this arm doesn't get squished too much, so you see how the pattern kind of uh, escapes a little, also these cases, but uh, most of the dead ends is covered in blue from the outer stripe of this rectangle. Okay, now I'll, I'll explain a little more uh, how this works. And uh, so this is, could be called discrete conformal equivalence of triangle meshes. And what you need for this theory is you have two triangle meshes that are combinatorially equivalent. So on the top, you have this cat's head. And on the bottom, you have a planar triangulation. But actually, you should, uh, this should also be, this is cut open, the, the left. So you should really glue this side to that side. On this side to that side uh, to get a really combinatorially equivalent triangulations and, uh, and 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 so this letter T will stand for the abstract triangulation, just the combinatorics. And all you need to know about these triangle meshes is the edge length function. So for each edge ij, you have a length lij, and uh, uh, and these two triangle meshes are discretely conformally equivalent if and only if there exists a function uh, from the vertex set to uh, the real numbers such that the new lengths uh, are related to the old lengths by this scale uh, factor. And that's just the uh, geometric mean of the scale factors at the vertices. And now, if you based on this, uh, notion, which is due to Feng Luo, you can consider the following discrete conformal mapping problem. So given your initial triangle mesh and desired angle sums for each vertex, so they have to satisfy a Gauss-Bonnet equation, namely uh, uh, the angles, the sum of all the angles at all the vertices is just the sum of all angles. So this can only be pi times the number of, uh, of triangles. So that's uh, an equality that has to be satisfied. Obviously, you can call it Gauss-Bonnet condition if you want to. Uh, so given the triangle mesh, abstract triangulation and edge length, edge length and the desired angle sums, find these logarithmic scale factors, u, such that the triangulation with the new edge length has angle sums as required at the vertices. So if you know the new edge length, you can compute the new triangles, provided the edge length satisfy the triangle inequalities. And if you know the angles, you can compute the sums at the vertices and you can check, yes, uh, that's a solution if the angle sums of this length function L tilde are actually the ones you want to have. Now, normally you would set uh, the angle sums at interior vertices. For example, if you want to map to the plane, you set the angle sums at interior vertices to two pi. And for example, for boundary vertices, if you set them to pi, then you would get straight boundary segments in the image. And here we put instead of two pi, an angle of pi also on these interior vertices and the tips of the ears. And that means that uh, what you get is uh, a triangulation in the plane with cone points uh, of total angle pi. And you get the real triangulation if you glue back these, 
these uh, segments of the edge. And you can tell actually that they fit together. This one and, and this one fit together perfectly and you would get some filter shape object, coffee filter shape object if you do them together. Um, now that's a um, very nonlinear system of equations, but not more. The angle sums are just some uh, equations in terms of trigonometric functions of the edge lengths. And you have to solve this large system of nonlinear equations. And you can do that practically because there is a variational principle. Namely, there is a continuously differentiable function depending parametrically on the triangulation, the original edge length, and the desired angle sums that takes uh, a set of scale factors, u, to a value, e of u, with the property, so this function has the property that the partial derivative with respect to one of these logarithmic scale factors is just the difference between the desired angle sum you put in, as in into your problem uh, and the actual angle sum that you get if you scale the original lengths by the scale factors u to get the, um, the new lengths L tilde, provided that L tilde satisfies the delta, the triangle inequalities around the vertex side. And, uh, but the function is defined even outside the geometric region where triangle inequalities are broken. And so what you get is uh, if your function u solves the mapping problem, there's a typo, or handwriter, uh, solves the mapping, if, if u solves the mapping problem, then u is a critical point of, the, of this energy function. Unfortunately, the opposite implication is not quite true. If u is a critical point of this energy function, then there are two cases. Either this new metric you get from the scale factors satisfies the triangle inequalities, and then this u is indeed a solution of your mapping problem, or uh, this a uh, new metric you get violates at least one triangle inequality. And then you know that a solution to this mapping problem does not exist, actually. Um, so what's good about this is this energy is a convex function. So if you want to solve a given mapping problem, you can use any old numerical method if you want to solve it numerically, you can use any old numerical method that minimizes convex continuously differentiable functions. It's even twice continuously differentiable in the geometric region of U, where the triangle inequalities are satisfied. In fact, it's analytic in that region. And in fact, there are weak conditions uh, on the angle sums that guarantee that the minimizer exists. Um, and if you know the new metric satisfies the triangle inequalities, it is the solution which is then unique because of the because the function is actually strictly convex in the geometric region. And unique means unique up to scale because of course you can scale up the metric without changing the angle sums, but that's the only uh, ambiguity you have. So what's bad is that the solution may not exist for given angle sums. Uh, because you get broken triangles and this is intractable. You know, one might think one can refine the theory to sort of give conditions, but I think there's no hope. So this is really a fundamental problem of this, this theory. Um, and what you have to do is extend this original definition of discrete conformality for triangle meshes to explain how you can change the triangulation and still say when they are discretely conformally equivalent. 
So, but how? And here, I think it's really a miracle that comes to the rescue, and that's, I've already talked about this. It's the hyperbolic metric induced by the circumcircles. So, here you see again a, a mesh where uh, you take for each triangle in the mesh, you consider the circumcircle lying in the plane of the triangle, and then, then you can reinterpret your Euclidean triangle with circumcircle uh, and say this is not a Euclidean triangle with a circumcircle, this is uh, um, a hyperbolic triangle with vertices at infinity in the hyperbolic plane represented here in the Beltrami Klein model. That's the non conformal model of hyperbolic of the hyperbolic plane in which uh, hyperbolic geodesics are also Euclidean straight lines. So this is really a Euclidean triangle with vertices at infinity. And uh, so per triangle, you get a new metric uh, on the, uh, on the a new hyperbolic metric on the triangle, except the vertices, which are at infinity now. And for neighboring triangles, these metrics agree. One way to see this is to realize that, so if you have two points on an edge, then there's a formula for the hyperbolic metric where all that enters is sort of the, the classical formula by Klein is really, if you want to know what the distance between two points is, you consider these two points and the intersections of the line through these two points with the uh, boundary, conic in the general case, and then all that enters is the cross ratio of these four points in the, and then the, the length is really the logarithm of the cross ratio in some suitable order, maybe one half, or whatever. But still that shows you that for these two neighboring triangles, the induced hyperbolic metrics on the edge, they agree because the boundary points are the same. So this cross ratio of these four points is the same. So you get the same distance for the left triangle and for the right triangle. Now, this establishes a, a uh, connection between discrete conformal equivalence and two-dimensional hyperbolic geometry. Namely, in the Theory with fixed triangulations, we already see that two combinatorially equivalent triangle meshes are discretely conformally equivalent if and only if they are isometric with respect to the induced hyperbolic metric. And this is the path to, uh, to um, you need one more ingredient you should also restrict to Delaunay triangulations. And that was an observation by uh, Feng Luo and his group. And then you can say this, two piecewise flat metrics on a surface with marked points and all the cone points of the metrics always have to be marked points. So this is sort of the category of surfaces with marked points and piecewise flat metrics, which are flat outside of the set of, of marked points. And two such things are called discretely conformally equivalent, equivalent if the hyperbolic metrics induced by the Delaunay triangulations on these uh, piecewise flat surfaces with marked points are isometric. Because you can, uh, it's, Delaunay triangulations are widely studied in the, in, for point sets in the plane or in R3 or whatever. But actually, if you have a piecewise flat metric with marked points, then uh, there always exists also a, a Delaunay triangulation on this set, meaning a triangulation where the circumcircle of each triangle is, is empty. Um, and that's a definition where now the triangulation depend, where the triangulations have been removed. And this can be done because you have this correspond, you have this unique Delaunay triangulation, almost unique Delaunay triangulation for the de determined by the metric. The only ambiguity is if you have concyclic triangles 
you may delete all the edges between them and re-triangulate the concyclic polygon. Uh, but otherwise, it's unique. There's a different but equivalent point of view of this definition. Uh, and that's, uh, let's, let's, for practical purposes, you always have a triangulation. So let's not get rid of this triangulation and formulate it like this. We only ever consider Delaunay triangulations or Delaunay triangle meshes. And, uh, and the, now, and we have length functions. And the difference to the previous definition is that now the abstract triangulations may differ. And they, the definitions stay discreetly conformally equivalent if they are related by a sequence of vertex scaling transformations of the kind we've seen before. And something weird, uh, a Ptolemy edge flip. And that means you take two neighboring triangles, remove the uh, common edge, and then construct a new pair of triangles by combinatorially flipping the edge and giving it the length obtained from Ptolemy's formula. This changes the shape of the triangle because it's not usually the edge length of the other diagonal in this Euclidean quadrilateral. It's a weird thing to conceive, but it's the right thing to do in this situation. Because while these Ptolemy flips change the Euclidean metric, unless the triangles are inscribed in the same circle, and that statement is just the classical Ptolemy's theorem, which says that uh, the diagonals in an inscribed quadrilateral uh, are related by this Ptolemy formula. So in that case, doing a Ptolemy flip and doing a Euclidean edge flip is exactly the same. It's just replace one diagonal by the other in this Euclidean triangle. But otherwise, if it's not inscribed in a circle, it does change the geometry. But while a Ptolemy flip changes the Euclidean geometry, it does not change the induced hyperbolic metric on this uh, set of two glued triangles. And moreover, this type of flip commutes with vertex scaling. So you can take the mesh, do a bunch of Ptolemy flips, and then apply vertex scaling, and the result will be the same as if you'd applied the vertex scaling first, and then done all these flips. And that's, uh, you can get that easily from this formula, actually. And, and so that's why this is actually uh, the same. The original definition by Lu is different, but also equivalent. And uh, so, so let, let me, I should say that they, uh, they introduced the Delaunay condition into this theory. Uh, but they don't have these Ptolemy flips or the hyperbolic metric. And so if you don't have that, you can only really do Euclidean flips whenever triangles become concyclic. So uh, you can do length scaling. And then at the moment that triangles become concyclic, you can flip. And then you can continue with length scaling until again you become concyclic and so forth. But you can only go as far uh, you can only go until you become non delaunay Okay, um, let me just add some more weird things. There's a famous algorithm to get Delaunay triangulations, namely you uh, 
search for edges that satisfy the Delaunay condition, meaning the circumcircle of one triangle on one side includes the vertex of the, the, the addition of the third vertex on the triangle on the right side. You find such violating edges and you flip them away. And uh, the classical result that uh, this flip algorithm terminates and gives you a Delaunay triangulation. Now, in fact, you can also do this Delaunay flip algorithm and with each, for each bad edge you find, you do a Ptolemy flip instead of a Euclidean flip. And again, you, this algorithm terminates and you end up with a proper Delaunay, Euclidean Delaunay triangulation um, of a surface with a different Euclidean metric in general, but the same hyperbolic metric. And in fact, this is just a, a reinterpretation of the uh, flip algorithm for hyperbolic surfaces of, of Jeff Weeks. So this is finding this Delaunay triangulation with Ptolemy flips is just a, a minor modification of the flip algorithm by taking out the Euclidean flips and plugging in the Ptolemy flips. And moreover, the variational principle for the discrete conformal equivalence of triangle meshes extends to this case of variable triangulations. In fact, you can take this function and make out of it, this was the original energy, the straight E, and make out of it a new function, the curly E, which also depends on your uh, initial triangulation, edge length function, and the desired angle sums. But how you evaluate this is different because if you're given, when you're given a U, what you do is you perform um, edge flips for this, you flip the, the um, you compute the new lengths in depending on the scale factors and perform Ptolemy flips to get to a Delaunay triangulation. And then you evaluate your old energy for this new uh, triangulation you get and the edge lengths you get after all these Ptolemy flips. And it turns out that this function is still convex and twice continuously differentiable. And you can easily compute it. You just uh, flip to Delaunay before evaluating the old function. And this actually gives you existence. This theory gives you existence and uniqueness theorems. So um, this existence and uniqueness theory is due to Lua in this group. And it says that if you're given a closed piecewise flat surface and desired cone angles, satisfying the necessary gauss bonnet equation, then there exists a new piecewise flat metric on the marked surface such that they are discretely conformally equivalent. And the new metric has the desired cone angles at the vertices. And this metric is unique up to scale. So if you set theta equals two pi, then by the gauss bonnet equation, you have to have uh, Euler characteristic zero. So you have to have a torus. Then you get a discrete uniformization theorem for tori. I'm not so convinced that if you set theta to some constant that you get uniformization theorems for other surfaces because constant angle defect is not the same as constant curvature because you have to divide by some area. You know, you could have really small triangles in one region and really large triangles in another. And if the angle defect at vertices is the same, that's not constant curvature. So for higher genus, analogous uh, theory, there's, there is in fact a completely analogous, analogous theory for, for surfaces that consist of hyperbolic triangles instead of Euclidean triangles, as in this theory. And, and it's maybe a bit confusing to have hyperbolic geometry in these two ways. So in, in the hyperbolic theory, these triangulations you start with are actually consist of finite hyperbolic triangles. 
And for the fixed triangulation case, the functionals and everything was worked out uh, uh, in this paper. And the variable triangulations and uniformization theorem uh, was proved in that paper. And actually, the the uh, the variational principle for variational for variable triangulations in the hyperbolic theory case is due to Posanov, and he treats it in a different language. So he calls that uh, energy a Hilbert Einstein functional, which is completely sensible and connects it to differential geometry in a meaningful way, actually. Now, what's left is so you have uh, discretization theorems for tori, for higher genus, and for genus zero. There's also a uniformization theorem, and it says that um, if you have a piecewise flat metric on the sphere, then there is a convex polyhedron inscribed in the sphere that is discretely conformally equivalent. And it's unique up to a Möbius transformation of the vertices. In fact, this is due to less P. Okay. The upcoming paper. And, um, and what you see here is a high resolution brain mesh, which was taken for the sole purpose, uh, for the sole reason that they are complicated meshes. They're difficult to uniformize and a map to a, a sphere with a globus, with a, with a globe texture on it. And, uh, and uh, so all these little vertices of this brain mesh are mapped to the sphere and give you a convex polyhedron with very small triangular faces inscribed in the sphere and it's discreetly conformally equivalent. Um, and as you see, all this can be computed efficiently and robustly. So you can't see that it's efficient, but that it can be computed in some way. I claim that at least. And in fact, what's hard in practice is that you have to keep track of three triangulations. You have the input triangulation, which is your brain mesh. Then you have to flip with Euclidean flips to an intrinsic Delaunay triangulation, because that's what you have to start with. Then you do your vertex scaling and Ptolemy flips to get at the final triangulation. And to get this texture map, you have to really, one way to do it and the way we do it is and chop up the mesh to get the overlay, the overlay triangulation of, of all these three triangulations. And that's really the, that's a hard bit that Mark had to fight with mainly because he coded everything. But the point is that here also methods from combinatorial topology actually help. Namely, we encode correspondence between triangulations with the same vertex set by a variation of the concept of normal coordinates um, that's known from combinatorial topology. So, um, in the Before you start time, part two, can yeah? I ask a question? Sure. Uh, in applications, I mean, usually then you maybe sample your data points from somewhere, mm -hmm. yeah, and you build up your shape. So, how robust is this now under, say, the number of vertices that I have? Yeah, it could be that in one sampling, yeah, I get more vertices and it really looks like I have my initial triangulation, but maybe with some added vertices, some subdivision of this. So the, the input mesh has to be a triangulation that does represent a surface. It has to be a two manifold. You can't have uh, non-manifold meshes. Otherwise, the number of vertices can be huge. And uh, the triangles can be bad because we re-triangulate. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is very robust and they ran it uh, on these data sets of 10,000 meshes, which, com which includes really bad meshes and also with desired angles and with cone singularity placements that are difficult. And essentially there are some things that can go wrong, but in part, they are, for example, uh, problems with the revolution or, uh, resolution of double precision numbers. You may have uh, really, so you may have in the computing the new edge lengths, it turns out that you can have 
uh, a dynamic range of edge lengths uh, by a factor of 10 to the 30. So that's uh, that's sort of the 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 I think that's something like the uh, the the diameter of the visible universe in millimeters. So so uh, you really can and 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 this fits together on both scales. But you can't represent this in the plane with double precision numbers because you don't have enough digits to really represent these large numbers and these small numbers. So that's the sort of problems you have. But apart from that, and also that's essentially where, where the limits are. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, I think so. Well, maybe, yeah. OK. So it's extremely robust. I think it's the most robust thing that exists and it gives you in the plane really um, also uh, up to double precision uh, injective maps. So without overlapping triangles. Now in the second part about ideal hyperbolic tetrahedra, um, polyhedra, I would like to explain how these discrete universe uniformization theorems I've been talking about are equivalent to realization theorems for ideal hyperbolic polyhedra, where what you prescribe is the intrinsic cusp metric of these ideal hyperbolic polyhedra. So essentially, it's this picture to map this bunny mesh to the sphere you want to compute a, uh, a polyhedron, a convex polyhedron with vertices on the sphere. So on the right, you see vertices on the sphere and you see a hyperbolic polyhedron. Now, if you would join these vertices, and this is a hyperbolic polyhedron in the Poincaré ball model, if you would use the Poincaré Klein model, if, if you would use the Beltrami Klein model of the three-dimensional space, you would have Euclidean triangles uh, connecting the same uh, vertices and uh, you would get really a Euclidean, uh, also what you could interpret as a Euclidean polyhedron with vertices on the sphere. And that's the, the uniformization, the discrete uniformization of this bunny mesh. And at the same time, what you're doing is you take the hyperbolic cusp metric induced by the circumcircles on the bunny mesh, you can read off the the edge length, the Euclidean edge lengths are the Penner coordinates of this uh, metric, hyperbolic metric. And you realize this cusp metric as a um, convex hyperbolic polyhedron with vertices at infinity. And these two problems are completely equivalent. Uniformize the bunny, realize the induced hyperbolic metric as a convex uh, ideal polyhedron. So the Delaunay condition. Uh, is equivalent to this convexity. And in fact, the spherical uniformization theorem in this form had already been proven, but it wasn't known that this is also, also a theorem about uh, uh, discrete uniformization of the sphere because that's uh, Rivin's realization theorem, which says that um, every complete hyperbolic metric of finite area on the punctured sphere is realized by a, by a unique convex ideal polyhedron in hyperbolic three space. There's a small trend. Uh, you have to allow um, ideal polyhedra, which are really, which degenerate to ideal polygons uh, with two sides. Well, that's just a small point. Uh, but then, you know, you have to, of course, uh, but then it's, uh, it's unique. And Riven's original proof is not constructive. There's no way to compute this um, ideal polyhedron. And the main difficulty is you don't know the right combinatorics of this polyhedron. All you have is this ideal metric, this cusp metric, you don't know where the final edges of the convex polyhedron are. And uh, now what's new is that we have a constructive proof. We can actually um, construct this polyhedron and even do so efficiently by just minimizing a convex function. 
there are analogous representation theorems of um, hyperbolic polyhedra. Essentially, all of them are due to uh, Francois Filastre. And they are equivalent to the respective discrete uniformization theorems. So uh, I cannot explain in detail how all this works, but um, I'll try to put some images into your heads that may guide you if you want to understand this. So there are essentially two important insights to understand this. And one is a correspondence between decorated ideal triangles and Euclidean triangles. So uh, a decorated ideal triangle is an ideal triangle in the hyperbolic plane decorated with horocycles centered at the vertices, at the ideal vertices. And you say, okay, to, then you can measure the truncated edge lengths. So originally the ideal, the sides of this triangle were infinitely long, but now you cut them off at the horocycles that you chose arbitrarily. And all of a sudden you have three side lengths. And the nice thing is that, okay, so there's, well, let me just say, there's, there's only one ideal triangle because they're all congruent. And by choosing these horocycles, you have now a way to distinguish them and explain how to glue them together. And that's the idea of Penner coordinates. And then you say, uh, you call these or Euclidean lengths, they're just e to the one half lambda. And the idea is that you can get at this correspondence in several ways. Actually, one is known for a long time from the theory of canonical triangulations. And it uses the um, hyperbolic hyperboloid model. But I would like to explain how you get at this correspondence using three dimensional uh, ideal tetrahedra. So this is the, this complicated picture is actually the half space model. This plane is the boundary at infinity. You have three vertices uh, in this plane at infinity and another one which uh, I chose to be the infinite point in the half space model. And uh, then you have a, an ideal tetrahedron with these vertices. At the bottom vertices, you have uh, horocycles. And at the top vertex, you also have a horocycle, which intersects the, it's a horizontal plane and it intersects the tetrahedron in this triangle. And since the intrinsic metric of uh, a horror sphere in hyperbolic three space is Euclidean. This here is really a Euclidean triangle. And the way the horror cycles were chosen in this ideal tetrahedron is that this horizontal horror sphere centered at infinity touches the horror spheres at the other ideal vertices. And uh, and then you can measure the truncated edge lengths of the base triangle, which is a decorated ideal triangle. Uh, there are lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, say. And you can compare that with the Euclidean length of, with the length of this Euclidean triangle cut out by the horizontal horror cycle. So that's sort of the vertex figure of the horror cycle at infinity. And you will find by an essentially two dimensional uh, computation that the relation between this length across the horror cycle, uh, across on the horror sphere and this truncated edge length of the triangle is just uh, that the Euclidean length is e to the one half the hyperbolic length. And one more thing. So the way you should think about this is and you build your spherical polyhedron by trying to put together building blocks like this, such that the ideal realization forms at the bottom uh, and, and plus the vertex at the top. And what you have to achieve is that these, um, all these tetrahedra have this same vertex at infinity and they have to fit together 
along the vertical sides so that they form a polyhedral surface uh, of ideal triangles uh, at the bottom. Uh, and, and as what you can do is change the Pana coordinates, uh, and that means you actually change these horror cycles, but you always keep them, the vertical truncated lengths zero. So you always have this triangle touching these horror cycles. And then you sort of change the shape of the tetrahedron. And at the bottom, all you do is um, sort of regaging the Pena coordinates, changing these lambda lengths. And on the top, which doesn't change the hyperbolic metric, and on the top, you actually do discrete conformal changes of this two-dimensional Euclidean triangulation. That's the one insight. And the other insight is that there are weird equivalences. So you have on this level, so, so you see the, 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 the different levels here. You have the Euclidean triangles, you have the ideal hyperbolic triangles. And you glue together tetrahedra like this, and you can ask if you have another ideal triangle next to it, whether this edge is convex or not. So whether they're like this or concave like that, viewed from above. And the, the, there's this weird equivalence between the edge on the bottom that you get is convex if and only if the, tri the Euclidean triangulation in this horosphere at infinity is Delaunay. And you can also have an intrinsic condition on the bottom triangulation, namely there you have decorated triangles and you can define a concept called a horocyclic Delaunay triangulation, which means if you have one decorated triangle and you consider the circle touching the vertices, the, the horocycles uh, of the one triangle, then the missing horocycle should uh, touch but not overlap this uh, touching circle. So this is sort of a horocyclic Delaunay condition, which is a reinterpretation of what's called uh, the natural triangulation in, in this, uh, um, uh, usually in, in this um, low dimensional geometry and topology. And these are all equivalent and that's the the fundamental insights that lead you to, be, to figure out that discrete conformality is really uh, the same as realizing hyperbolic metrics uh, as convex polyhedra. Let's leave it there. Thanks for your attention. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments? Hi, Boris. I want to know that uh, you, 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 you see that you proved the case for the genus zero, right? Uh, you, you mean that <coughs> the uniformization theorem is equivalent to Riven's theorem? I, I don't yes. know. Uh, what's the difference from the result for uh, von Lord's first result on the uh, Euclidean case, in the Euclidean case? Can, can you explain more on this? That you mean that in your result, you write it in the, in the form of cone angle. You mean that the uniformization in the case of genus zero, there's some restriction on the cone angle or something at other conditions? Actually, it's more complicated than that. So um, there's, there's, you know, there's this theory with Euclidean triangles yeah. of uh, discrete conformality. And there's the theory with hyperbolic triangles, where uh, you can you can use to to uniformize higher genus surfaces, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the idea would be: shouldn't there be an analogous theory with spherical triangles with which you can uh, uniformize the sphere? And the answer is yes, such a theory could be made, but unfortunately, it is useless. You can get variational principles and all that, but the the functions you get are not convex anymore. And so nobody has ever figured out how to use them to actually prove something or reliably compute things, right? Because you have to find critical points of non-convex functions. So to, to get this Riven's theorem and uniformization of the sphere, 
in a constructive way with a variational principle, you always transform it to a problem that you can solve with the Euclidean triangle theory. And that works because you have this ideal polyhedron and you may simply choose one vertex to be special, one ideal vertex and say, I'll, I'll, let's move this one vertex to the infinite point of the, hyper, of the half space model, say. Yeah. And then, then it looks like this. You have the adjacent faces of this vertex at infinity will become horizontal planes in the half space model that form in the base, uh, in, um, in the rest of the region, uh, a convex polygon. And in that, you will have a triangulation whose circumcircles are the remaining faces of this ideal polyhedron. And the idea is to use the Euclidean variational principle and the Euclidean theory to somehow get this spherical polyhedron. And that's why it's always the most tricky case. Really. Okay, thank you, thank you very much for your explanation. Yeah.